the one shot. So I'm going back to, I'm on a barge for two days trying to get the shark to look real. And, and the sad fact was the shark would only look real in 36 frames, not 38 frames. And that two frame difference was the difference between something really scary and something that looked like a great white floating turd. Out of my way. Well, I got so desperate on Terminator 2, trying to shorten that film to a you know, manageable length, as we all understand that to be, that I said, well, wait a minute, do we really need all these frames? If we just took out one frame every second for the entire film, we'd shorten the film by a couple of minutes. Let's just do it as a test. We'll take a reel, and we'll take out one frame in every 24. And the editors looked at me like I was nuts. Let's just try it. Come on, nobody's ever done this. We took out one frame in every 24, and it was a mess. There were jerks, there were things, there were cuts in the wrong places. It, you, you totally saw it, and it just didn't work. Every one of those individual frames was important. Once you know that as an editor, now you get scared for a while. It's like, geez, you know, am I cutting here or am I cutting here? Uh, but then after a while, you start to realize that, that there's great power in that, too. D.W. Griffith was the first great filmmaker to understand the psychological importance of editing. Working a decade after Porter, he did more than anyone else to advance the storytelling tools Porter had developed. Griffith invented and popularized techniques that established the basic grammar of film. His melodramas were the first to draw audiences into the emotional world of his characters. He certainly was the first man to use the close-up in a big way. This was revolutionary. It was so revolutionary that the producers, when they saw this, were aghast. They thought, you can't put this picture out like this. You can't cut to this big, ugly shot of somebody. First of all, we're paying for this actor, this actress. We want to see their whole body. We don't want to just see their face. Second of all, the audiences won't know what to respond to. They're going to be all confused. Well, the proof is in the pudding, and the reality is that the audiences were not confused at all. Griffith brought it together in one magnificent film, Birth of a Nation, and we saw the accumulation of sort of 10 years of editing knowledge put into a movie. And all of a sudden, you had not only had close-ups, but you had flashbacks. Parallel action. And you had all sorts of things that he used to make the audience his attention focused on a certain part of the frame. D.W. Griffith established the tenets of classical film editing. And classical film editing relied on the concept of the invisible cut, in which action would always be continuous and fluid and moving. The goal was to mask the cut so the audience wouldn't notice and could forget that they were watching a movie. Let's take another look. Notice how the gesture matches from one shot to the next? Griffith's seamless editing is still practiced today and was the dominant editing style in Hollywood movies for decades. At last. Look again. The cut is so smooth that it's barely noticeable. It's all foretelling the story. And all you want to do is get the person emotionally invested in the story. So it becomes this invisible craft. We call it the invisible art. And indeed, it is. I mean, the more invisible we are, the better we're doing our job. Unfortunately, the invisible style of editing kept editors invisible and unappreciated as well. For years, they have been the best kept secret of the movies. The first cutters were considered hands for hire rather than creative partners in the filmmaking process. They looked at the images by holding the film up to the light then they would check their work by running it through a projector and making the necessary adjustments. Griffith's main cutter was Jimmy Edward Smith, who virtually lived with him at the studio, where they worked far into the night, running the film shot during the day. Later, Smith's wife Rose joined the editing team. The Smiths married during the cutting of Intolerance. For their honeymoon, Griffith allowed them the weekend off. Lights! Needs about 20 minutes out of it. The Kazan Lights film, The Last Tycoon, had a wonderful scene. It was obviously the story of Irving Thalberg. And I always took that as a wonderful metaphor about the, the, uh, the editing process, that it's, it's, it, it, it's, it's silent, it's anonymous. <laughs>
What's that, are you asleep? Jeez, goddamn movie even puts the editor to sleep. He's not asleep, Mr. Brady. What do you mean he's not asleep? He's dead, Mr. Brady. Dead? What do you mean he's dead? He must have died during... He's dead. We were just watching the rough cut. Jesus, I didn't... I didn't hear anything. Did you hear anything? Not a thing. Eddie... He probably didn't want to disturb the screening, Mr. Brady. Today, not only is the editor still alive, but he has become the director's key collaborator. No other crew member spends as much time working alone with the director. Finding the relationship with the editor is like trying to decide whether or not to get married. Because if the marriage isn't a good one, it's going to be a sticky divorce. When I was doing my first movie, the only thing I knew is I wanted a female editor. Because I just felt a female editor would be more nurturing to the movie and to me. I wouldn't try to be winning their way just to win their way, all right? They wouldn't be trying to shove their agenda or win their battles with me. They would be nurturing me through this process. Give me air. He's gonna kill me, man! Who the fucking got that? Hey. I think editors play a big role with directors in giving them support, making them feel like they can, they can look at something that may have trouble or problems and be comfortable enough so that they can approach those problems. Hi, Vincent. I'm getting dressed. In the beginning, he really doesn't guide me. And then I put together what I think he wants. And pretty much, we've worked together so long, I can judge what he would want. The fuck is this place? This is Jack Rabbit Slims. An Elvis man should love it. Come on, man, let's go get a steak. You can get a steak here, Daddy-o. Don't be a... Oh, after you, kitty cat. Initially, I had it, like, really long. It was... It was like a date in real time, all right? And it was sort of like Sally's job to kind of, like, you know, little by little convince me to bring it down and bring it down and bring it down, and it's, it still could be funny. You would still have what I'm talking about, but maybe it wouldn't be so painful. He did want it to feel very much like a date, and it was very long at first, and we just had to kind of live with it for a while. <laughs> just like, you know, letting me live with it long enough so I could eventually, okay, I've had it enough, I've seen that enough, okay, maybe now I can lose this part, okay, so well, now it's, it was like here, and now it's like here. Finally, we'd bring it down and bring it down, and then I kind of brought it too far down, and then he said, we've got to bring it back out. That's it. No more, no more, no more, no more. This, you know, this is not a video. We do that for eight months, so intense. I see him more than my husband. And sometimes I, you know, get annoyed with her for not reading my mind 100%, I mean. All right, you know, it's not good enough that she reads it 80% of the time, all right? <gasps> we work very intensely together, and it's kind of amazing that we still like each other. If I was with my husband that long, I don't think I'd like him that much. So <laughs> By the time I've thought of an idea, written it, found the financing, cast the film, directed it, I get to the cutting room and it's like I've washed up on shore. Because I'm so happy to be there, because then I think, now we can start making the film.